The Sovereignty and Providence is important in Milwaukee because there are a lot of disparities within the community. There are a lot of issues that SDC tackles on a daily basis. I came here today because I was really excited about the work that SDC is doing and the fact that the summit was bringing together over 500 people, a great way for our team to network as well as learn lots of new information. You know, every time we have a summit on poverty, what we're trying to do is just plant a seed in someone's head that they walk away and think a little differently about what they're doing because it's going to take all of us and all of us do a little something different. We've been evolving for 60 years. We've been learning for 60 years. And we're still learning. Jason Wilson is the founder and CEO of the Union Pronounced Union, a nonprofit organization in Detroit, Michigan. Since 2003, the union has effectively reached more than 17,000 youth through innovative, prevent innovative prevention programming. In 2008, Mr. Wilson's heart for misguided black boys inspired him to create and direct the Cave of Adullam Transformational Training Academy. Mr. Wilson's leadership has garnered the, or CATA, we're gonna, you know we about them acronyms too. Uh, CATA, uh, Mr. Wilson's leadership has garnered CATA numerous acknowledgements and awards for his work teaching males how to introspectively control, confront, and conquer their emotions with composure. In 2016, Mr. Wilson was invited to present the CATA at the President Obama's My Brother's Keeper Showcase at the White House. Mr. Wilson is the recipient of the 2017 General Motors African Ancestry Network's Inspiration Award. I could go on and on. Uh, Mr. Wilson is the author of two bestsellers, Cry Like a Man and Battle Cry. Y'all know if we would have had enough time, we would have had a book signing so y'all could get that work. But we, we trust that Jason is going to come back to us. Awesome. Uh, he has also been on several programs from The Breakfast Club to The Joe Rogan Experience. Mr. Wilson is a man of the most high, a faithful husband of over 25 years and a proud father of two beautiful children. I had to get to that work. I, I know out of all your accolades, that's what you're most proud of. Ladies and family and gentlemen and friends, Mr. Jason Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you. I'm, I'm truly humbled to be here. Uh, when I received the request, uh, my agent mentioned it to me. I'm like, wow, the Summit on Poverty. And the way I grew up, we, in our communities, we bragged about the roughest neighborhoods. We bragged about the struggle. So it was refreshing to get an invite and to see the work that you've been doing here for over 60 years. So let's give it up. That was truly amazing. I was so convicted after uh, Dr. Patton had spoke, so much so that I called my daughter when I was in my room, and this may be the fifth or sixth time that I've apologized to her for spanking her. Yes. And at 29 years of age, she thanked me again. So she hadn't really healed from it. She didn't say, Dad, you don't need to say that anymore. She says, Dad, I appreciate you still saying that because of the trauma I inflicted just only being a disciplined dad. And the brother who gave the, the powerful spoken word on half, I want to talk to us as men as well while we're living as half humans. 
Um, when I did a little research um, about poverty and especially what I do to teach, train, and transform boys, there was a few like stats that jumped out to me. Fatherless families are four times more likely to raise children in poverty, and 84% of homeless families are headed by women. And when I recall when I first started the Cave of Adullam, I had one student, I leave nameless, his grades, he was a smart kid, but all of a sudden his grades started to plummet. And I pulled him to the side, I said, hey, what's going on? Ain't someone's bullying you? I mean, do you need anything? And I just happened to look at his clothes. They were filthy. So he couldn't focus on school because his clothes were dirty. I go to the principal, the principal buys a washer and dryer, has it installed at the school. We would wash these kids' clothes and his grades went right back up. So I connected like, well, wait a minute. So what I'm doing trying to heal this boy is imperative to us helping to decrease poverty because so many of us as men are walking around with broken boys inside. Hence why we have these stats of us running. Boys can't be fathers. Boys can't be responsible. And that's my mission is to heal the broken boy. If not, we'll continue to see this. Outbursts of anger, frustration. Men die by suicide three to four times as likely as women. Uh, over, I think it's like 75% of the homicides in the United States are committed by us. When, uh, people who live to be over 100, nine out of 10 are women. We suppress all of our emotions. We've been conditioned to not cry. What doesn't kill us can only make us stronger. And we wonder why our families don't really know what's going on until they're burying us. This is a poverty mindset that we must eradicate. Frederick Douglass, one of my favorite quotes, he says, it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. Although this quote is accurate, I believe that we fail by leaving men broken. And so that's my goal. And this next clip is from a documentary. Uh, the actor Lawrence Fishburne uh, reached out after one of our videos went viral in 2016 and filmed our academy. Uh, we won several awards at Tribeca Film Festival for the emotional stability work we do with boys and young men. In this scene, you will see how there is no spirit of condemnation. The hyper-masculine model that many of us have been conditioned under as far as our coaches and the men in our lives, I've taught and I've learned that out of all the years I've been training and working with boys, they didn't need more discipline, specifically black boys, they needed more love. And when you watch this clip, you'll see how he was ready to fail, ready to give up because of his circumstances. But when you pour into a young man and encourage him and let him know that he's there, that you're there listening to him, he's able to accomplish things beyond his own fears. Watch this. Emmanuel Taylor here to test for his faith stone. You ready? Yes, sir. All right, the spiritual side first. What is faith? Faith is a confidence of what we hope for, what I see happen. It gives, it gives us, it gives us insurance about things we cannot do. I mean, we can. I mean, I can't test right now. What'd you say, sir? I can't test right now. Why? I don't know. You can't test. You got a lot of weight on you. Look at me. I know you got a lot of weight on you. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. What would he say to you right now? You know who I'm talking about. He can do this? You know he would say that. You know it. It's just your mind is moving so fast, son. Yes, sir. Breathe. I'm going to sit here next to you. Let's go. Faith is the confidence of what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us serious about things we cannot see. Excellent. Oh, Excellent. I told you. When I started the cave, I thought black boys needed discipline. There you go, son. Get on top of them. I realized quickly they didn't need more discipline. Good. They needed more love. I woke up to the morning sky first. And so what started as a martial arts academy, what started as, I'm sorry, as a martial arts mentoring program, became a safe space for boys to release all that they've been holding on to 
throughout their days so that they can finally be free from what I call misconstrued masculinity. Our mission is to teach, train, and transform uninitiated boys into comprehensive men of the Most High. Men who are physically conscious, mentally astute, but spiritually strong enough to navigate through the pressures of this world without succumbing to their negative emotions or just their emotions in general. We have an intake form in the Cave of Adullam for everyone who wants to join our academy. The demand for what we do is so great that we have now over 800 boys on our waiting list. When they, when they fill out this intake form, the data our in-house evaluation was able to gather, 98% of our recruits circled anger out of the top five emotions that they felt. And that 86% of our boys did not know why they were angry. So when I first started in schools, I started noticing lockers were being kicked in. I mean, I was taking pictures at every school, this anger, I'm like, where is this coming from? And our boys were angry because everyone was expecting them to be men, but they didn't have a man patiently in their lives teaching them how to be one. And so I'm like, well, wait a minute, where is the cause and effect? What's happening? So then I participated in scare straight programs. Then I quickly discovered that re-traumatizing a boy would not help him release what he's been through. Yeah. Our boys never needed to be scared straight. They needed to be healed. And so when I, I changed my whole philosophy, I'm like, well, wait a minute. My ancestors, my grandfather was lynched. I saw intergenerational trauma affect so many lineages, lineages in my family. And I said, I have to stop this because just as we can have intergenerational trauma, we can have intergenerational healing. Yeah. So when I started allowing myself to be vulnerable and got rid of my poverty mindset, both of my, I had two brothers that were murdered. Uh, my best friend dropped dead of a heart attack. I can go on and on, but I had to have my mind renewed, which is why I am a man of the most high. And because of that renewing, I'm able to be what I call a comprehensive man. I am masculine. However, I am more than masculine. I'm compassionate, but I'm courageous. I'm strong and I'm sensitive. I am now freely able to live from the good in my heart instead of my fears. And that became, uh, clear, let me go back, when this video went viral in 2016. This is normal. This happens every day in our academy where I compassionately allow my heart to hear the words of what our students are, going, are dealing with internally. As a result, it, I think it had yeah, 300 million views worldwide. Worldwide coverage because I simply said we cry as men. Our nonprofit shut down for two days because of the phone calls we were receiving from all over the world. Men did not hold back. They were crying to our women's staff, saying, I wish I would have had a coach who cared for me or listened to me the way Mr. Wilson does. It even was translated in the China Times. It was so popular that This Is Us, MBT's hit TV show, used our initiation ceremony in one of their largest episodes. They actually won an award for something God gave us. So this was a key I saw that opened the door for our minds to break free from this deficit mentality. Lawrence Fishburne came to the academy and says, Jason, we have to get this rite of passage out to our boys. This is why so many grown men are still stuck in their parents' basements. They want to come out, but they're scared. I call it emotional incarceration, but I'll deal with that in a second. Because when a boy doesn't have a ceremony, a public acknowledgement that you are now a man and we are now to treat you like one, he's stuck into doing childish things, like abandoning responsibilities. As a result, this documentary came out and we won, I think, a Best Documentary Film, uh, First Place Audience Award, and Best Editing for a Documentary at Tribeca because of the message that's behind it. This video here, what moved people, Bruce, but people didn't know, that board that he couldn't break, he broke it many times before the test. But because his parents were there and the pressure was around, that board became his fear of failure. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of us have boards right in front of us right now. 
And we, as soon as we hit it, we feel that pain and resistance, but we don't have the mental fortitude or even the healing from past trauma or past failures to even break through this board. Everybody say fear of failure. Fear of failure. All right, now I want to talk about breaking through emotional barriers, which we all can benefit from this. Everyone say faith. We got to wake up. Good. Now, faith, if you, do not, if you don't believe it, you can achieve it. That's the first thing I had to teach Bruce, that that board has to be broken before he hits it. And so often in life, we put in front of us the things that have happened in the past or our failures. I write in my new book, Battle Cry, that we have to stop allowing trauma to time travel. And I tell you a short story when I was young and uh, I went to the store to get some chocolate chip cookies. And the German Shepherd was outside like he was waiting for me. So as I started walking, I noticed the German Shepherd started walking behind me. So I started running because I was scared. The dogs chased me. I stopped. He stops looking at me, tongue out. <laughs> like, what is this? So I walk again. He started walking. I start running. He started running. And I stop, and he stops and just looks at me and starts panning again. I said, wait a minute. He's, he thinks I'm playing. I'm just running because he's running. <laughs> What was interesting, as soon as I stepped out of the parking lot and kept walking, I thought he would keep following me, he stopped. That's trauma. If we can leave it where it was, we can truly manifest where we are. And that's what hinders us. So because we failed at breaking that board, or failed at parenting, or failed at whatever, as soon as it comes back up in front of us, we already are defeated. Everyone say faith. faith. If you don't believe it, you can't achieve it. The next F, because it's called the four Fs, say focus. focus. Stay focused on what matters instead of the matters that don't. To break a board in martial arts or any barrier or to break a jaw, there's a button. There's a small target. We can hit all around it and it will not break. Any bad habit, if you're struggling with obesity, for me when I was dieting, trying to get in the best shape of my life, I had to remove the things that would cause me to stumble from me attaining that goal. For me, it was Lay's potato chips. <laughs> so I had to remove them out the house. But what's even deeper than that, for many of us as men, those of us who struggle with lust, the Holy Spirit told me one day when I was struggling, just I said, let me just get one chip, one chip. He was like, interesting. He says, if you can't deny those bag of Lay's, how are you going to deny that woman's legs? This is just food. What happens when I have a weak moment and I'm not really focused on the task in front of me? I start fighting in my own strength and never really break the temptation. That's why it's important that we stay focused. Say focus. focus. So once Bruce was able to move past his fear of failure and to focus on what was in front of him, he had another F. Say fortitude. Fortitude, fortitude empowers you to give up what's causing you to give up. That makes you push through the pain, whatever you're feeling. You have to keep pushing through. Right now, I have pain shooting down my leg as I'm talking to you. But I've been trained to put that behind me until I'm done with whatever God has called me to do. But you can't live in fortitude, and that's why many of us as men, we're struggling out here and we're dying. We won't go see the doctors. We won't get uh, prostate exams. We act like when he pulls his finger out, all of our masculinity is gone. You do not want to die with prostate cancer. Trust me, I've seen it. And you, don't have to. you don't have to. But that's, I, I get to that in a minute. The last F, say follow through. Follow through. Follow through is the evidence that your faith, focus, and fortitude are working together. And that's what Bruce saw once he received that it was nothing wrong with crying, son. I know it's painful, but you can push through it. You broke this board before. If you just focus on what's in front of you instead of worrying about who's around you, you can do it. The fortitude, I've trained you. We've all been through enough adversity that makes us stronger. Break through it, it's only one second, and the follow through will confirm that you can do it. So watch this, you'll be very encouraged. It's only one minute. Juice. Ah! Juice. Pull in, punch all the way through. When you feel the pain, go all the way through. That could be a barrier in life or anything. Punch hard. Ah! Ah! You gotta punch it hard enough. Punch through it. You feel pain? Shake that off. Let's go. Ah! 
It actually got me uh, emotional because his father, that's the only reason I recorded it was for him because that's a good friend of mine. And um, the beautiful thing about what we do is that the fathers get to see themselves in their sons. And in that process, I have video of fathers crying as they're watching the training because they say, I haven't healed from that. He sees that in me. And so it, it keeps going throughout generation and generation. But when we put ourselves in position as men to be more than masculine and become all that we're meant to be as human beings, we can finally heal. I released this book called Cry Like a Man right after the video went viral. And my dedication was to every man who is tired of not being able to say he is tired. So often, I had to bury my best friend Daryl strongest guy in the gym would never let us spot him in the gym. If he was struggling with the way he said, let go, let go, I got it, I got it, and he would rack it. The problem with that mentality, he carried it into his life and he never let his friends spot him in life. Daryl dropped dead of a massive heart attack at the age of 41. He didn't know how to cry like a man. He didn't know that what doesn't kill you may not make you stronger, it just didn't kill you then his work ethic, his stress level, even the monster energy drinks, the doctors say all played a role in all four of his arteries clogging up. And as men, when this book came out, I'm like, okay, how do you promote a book like this in 2018 and 19 when everyone was so big on only being masculine males? When it came out, everyone, I didn't ask any of these brothers to take pictures with this book. Even the last one, Tyrese, is, is interesting because we all know him, right? I mean, you think you do. He reached out to me, so is Terry Crews. This brother Tyrese was in a mental health crisis. He was trying to see his daughter, had a breakdown, filmed himself crying, and was ridiculed by our community for doing what most men are admonished for not doing. As long as we're only centered around what we can do as men, for, uh, my men here, you can never truly be who you are. We're stuck in a performance-based life and that's why I'm reached out by so many athletes who are struggling and suffering in silence. You see the millions, you see the fame, but they're suffering from a mentality that only allows them to live from what they do. And as a result, they're stuck in what I call emotional incarceration. Emotional incarceration is a self-imposed mental imprisonment when a boy or man confines his quote-unquote non-masculine emotions and isolates his heart from the world. And as parents, we see this in our sons. Everyone read this on three, one, two, three. And then we wonder why when they become a teenager, this happens. Read this on three. One, two, three. Why can't you just show us a kind of emotion? 
We program our sons to suffer in silence. I was one. I deal with so many boys who contact me suicidal. Thankfully, I open up certain direct messages because I get too many to respond to, but grown men are literally at the edge of killing themselves. And I'm able to connect them with psychotherapists from across the country to help these men heal and break free from emotional incarceration. This is me as a young boy. This is how we all start. Beautiful, fun-loving, cheerful. Love my mom. Love living. But something happened that changed that boy into a hardened young man. Everyone say trauma. trauma. Trauma, a psychological emotional response to an event or an experience that is deeply distressing or disturbing. This is why I love the work that's being done here because we have to expose the lie and that we are born to, uh, we're born into trauma, like trauma is just a part of the black experience. And I hate I missed a speaker who was here the day before who talked about re rebranding blackness. But our culture promotes it and we have to call it out as well. This happened in 1984. This is my good friend Kelly Crittington. She was shot in the head in eighth grade in school, the first middle school shooting in Detroit history. This is my good friend. All of my friends had guns. I was going to bring my stepfather gun. We had conflict with a middle school about two or three miles away from our school. By the way, this was a Catholic school. Our parents paid for our education here. Friend was passing in the gun across. Gun went off, shot Kelly in the back of the head. She died. Her mother said, who is a great friend of ours to this day, she says, I'm concerned about the children. That's a traumatic thing to happen to any 13 or 14 year old. They could be mentally scarred for a week, a month, a year, or forever. The guy who uh, accidentally shot Kelly is dead today. The other gentleman who had a gun, we still don't even know where he is. We had no social workers in our school at that time. No one to talk to. I'm in the backyard because I was still training in martial arts, throwing ninja stars at a tree, killing the tree, because I couldn't process what I just saw at school, watching my friend's blood out, uh, pour out of her body. No one to talk to. No wonder our kids accept the type of poverty mentality that we're stuck in this life, but we can change it. As a result of this, as a result of unhealed trauma, studies have not concluded how it actually can be mistaken for ADHD. Thank you. A 2010 study found that about 20% of the 4.5 million children currently identified as having ADHD likely have been misdiagnosed. Wow. Children who experience trauma with undiagnosed attention problems are at risk of experiencing academic failure, suspension, and expulsion. This then leads to high-risk behaviors, tantrum, aggression, and entry into the juvenile justice system. Follow up with Dr. Patton. For me, I went from that boy, honor roll student, loving my mom, to this guy, less loving, more angry. I had to adapt to my culture. My grades plummeted. Attitude was unacceptable. That's a gun in my hand. So now we got to look at the cause and effect. I came up in hip hop, so I don't necessarily blame it, but look at the album covers. Look at what it promotes. They were called the lynch mob. Again, my grandfather was beaten and lynched. We wear trauma like it's a badge of honor and it perpetuates this poverty mindset in our communities. This is a exercise we do in the academy. It's called the tree of trauma. You have the roots, you have the trunk. The roots is what's feeding the hearts of these boys and minds. And then out of that comes these branches, unresolved anger, lack of focus, fear and depression. Lastly, suicidal thoughts. Until we are able to deal with the roots of what's causing all of these issues, we cannot eradicate it. So what we typically do of what I've seen in schools and parents, we'll cut the branches off, but the branches keep growing back. Until we uproot what's feeding this tree, the tree will never be healthy. Majority of the boys who fill out this chart, they say that their roof comes from their father wound or their mother wound. And until we're able to heal the parent, no matter the good work that we do, we send them back home, the problem perpetuates. 
So say, what is a verbal processor? Say it. A verbal, a verbal processor is a person who can vocalize their thoughts and emotions, effectively communicating why they feel and act the way they do. As parents, we were trained, or I was programmed to, uh, whatever, you, whatever I say goes. I was sharing, I don't know if I shared it, I don't know if I shared it with you earlier about, I don't even whoop my dog. I feel that I'm intelligent enough to train this animal to respond the way I need him to without having to beat an animal. So if I have that regard for an animal, why can't I have it with my children? As a parent, the best thing I could have done besides giving my life to the Most High was psychotherapy. It helped me process really what I was living from. And it was the unresolved anger of my father not being there in my life. The trauma of my brothers being murdered and my mother seeing her have a nervous breakdown and going through dementia. But when I finally found healing, I was able to become a verbal processor and in that process was able to help my students process their emotions. You'll see in this short scene, Kevin is from the documentary as well, smart young man. But his parents, he has both parents in the home. No one understood why Kevin's grades were dropping. Kevin had been bullied when he was younger for his skin. He had eczema. And he didn't understand all of the guards he had placed up where he couldn't perform in life, where he actually put his own emotional barriers up and was OK with living a limited life. But this scene you'll see here where not only was I able to help him see it, but he figured it out himself. Watch this. So where are your pants, Kevin? You know, if I was a betting man, I'd say you left your pants on purpose because you didn't want to test. What you going to do, man? You got to look in the mirror. It ain't your mother, it ain't your father, it's you. <laughs> you understand? It's OK to cry, son. Look, it's cool, man. Why are you crying? Because I'm frustrated. OK, why are you frustrated? I don't know. There's always cause and effect, like how you had to become the clown to distract people from talking about you when your skin was bad, right? Yes. Like, people will always ask me about my skin. They would call me eczema boy. Every time I came in close contact with a person, they would scream. That's trauma, son. Mm -hmm. And maybe you probably need to cry a little more to get some of this stuff out you. Kevin today is about to graduate from high school. If you watch the documentary, the school that he wanted to go to, Cass Tech, his grades weren't good enough to get in there. But after training at our academy, he understood his cause and effect, and now he's about to graduate. So let's give it up for Kevin. <laughs> our time is flying. What happens to our bodies when we suppress our emotions? People who bottle up their emotions increased their chance of premature death from all causes by 30%. I'm going to stay there real quick. Doing the work that I do uh, is definitely heavy compassion fatigue. Um, a ninth grader who wanted to join uh, the Cave of Adullam at his school, beautiful young boy, knew that this one party he shouldn't be at because there were guys there who didn't like him. But he didn't want to punk out. Went to the party. I get a phone call that Monday. He was shot and killed. He had so many, so much pain inside of him. How many men or young men you know right now or that you can think of in the past that would be here if they had an opportunity to really talk about what they were going through? With their risk of being diagnosed with cancer increasing by 70%. So men, for me, when I bottle up my emotions, I start becoming depressed, more angry, frustrated. But as soon as I cry and release it, meditate, get with my friends' camaraderie, journal, to get this stuff out of me, I'm not only a better father and husband, but I was a better son and a better person. The data, this is something we have to look at. For the first time in history, black boys 11 years of age and younger die by suicide more than any other race. I shared this earlier. Just about every country, men die by suicide three times as likely as women. 
Look at the culture. The rapper Drake says, I pop bottles because I bottle my emotions. This is what that looks like. This is a young man who came to my office, cutting his wrists. No one knew the cause and effect until we started talking with him. It's because his father wasn't in his life. When I gave him an opportunity to express what he was feeling, he completely changed. Went to the military, very successful young man, because he stopped bottling up what he was feeling. Because eventually, it is going to come out. And men commit 75.6% of violent crimes in the country. How many of you guys know who this man is? Do you know who he is? Somebody say his name if you know his name. Say Steve Stevens. He went on a, uh, a rampage on Facebook, shot and killed this innocent man here, Robert Godwin Jr. I want you to listen to this next clip. Let me go back. I want you to listen to this clip. As a counselor, a therapist, a friend, and listen to what this man say regarding to why he took this innocent man's life. Dog. Just call, just call, just call Jason or, or Gary and look at it, man. I can't talk to you right now, man. I'm f***ed up, man. I'm at the point where I snap. See, the thing is, man, every time I try to talk to y'all, I'm man. Y'all will always blow me off or, or, or just make my seem like it ain't I got a lot of built-in anger and frustration, man. I just, I just snap, man. You know, and it's some hope that I will let a or anybody get me on my hookup. But see, the thing is, man, I'm 37, and all my life, man, I just always been a monster, man. Always had to prove myself, you know, always had to take the butt to people's jokes. You know, uh, she put me in my, 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 my pushing point, man. What was his cause and effect? Somebody just yell out. Yell out one of them. What made him kill Robert Godwin? Good. Specifically, though, what was one of his issues, he said? His friends wouldn't listen to him. What else? What was his main cause and effect? No. All right, let's stop. This is the problem. We're not listening. He specifically said it was a breakup with his girlfriend. Do you see? Oh, I'm going to play it again? I, 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 yeah, he said, he said H-O-E, but yeah, but I give you a pass on that. <laughs> All right, I give you a pass. I give you a pass. <laughs> All right, so okay. And we won't say that again. We won't say the word. But he had to break up with his girlfriend, all right? <laughs> he felt unheard and, unimportant, and unimportant. He repressed his emotions. As a result, he died by suicide. The power of crying, gentlemen, and women too. I just told my wife, I said, I can't recall the last time, specifically, I've seen a black woman cry to be strong for so many, and now you're repressing your emotions. My other sister's a different ethnicity. I ask you to ponder the same thing. Because tears, this is Dr. William Frey. He discovered that emotionally induced tears contain not only water, but also stress hormones that are released from our bodies when we cry. That's why we typically feel better after we cry. The only tears you see pretty much now are tattooed, but they're crying too. Kevin Gates actually, me and him, I, we, we exchanged phone numbers. Cry Like a Man helped him start his healing journey. When you see this, they're telling you I'm hurting. That's why I tell my young boys, you may not be crying God's way, but you're crying in other ways, like your grades, your disobedience, the guys you're hanging with your struggles, your, addic your addiction to drugs, your reckless uh, uh, lifestyle choices. Now, let's expose the myth of masculinity. Wow, time is flying. Who knows, what is masculinity? Can somebody tell me, please? Anybody, a brother, I, specifically, I'd love to hear a brother. What's masculinity, brother? Just me feeling honest in your life. 
Consistency, honesty, and light. Someone else, one more. The ideology of what a man should be. The ideology of what a man should be. That's good. It's really good. Let's look at the definition, though. Having qualities traditionally ascribed to men as strength and boldness. That's it. It's an adjective. But we've allowed it to define who we are as men. It is not a comprehensive definition of what a man is. My mother had to be masculine at times when she had to go up to the school and confront some of my teachers. This is why I respect women with high regard. During an era where the society tried to define them or confine them to a certain place in, in, in life, they didn't settle for it. Uh, men used to say a woman's place is in the kitchen or uh, the reason my wife doesn't need a watch because she has one on the stove. But really, look at us as men. We've allowed society to confine us to only being protectors and providers. And we wonder why we're so mentally unhealthy. Anyone knows who this woman is? Does she possess any what they call masculine qualities? Oh yeah, this is her gun and her sword. Who is this woman? Yes, sir. Mary who? Mary Fields. Was she strong and masculine at times? Say yes. She was the first African-American woman to work for the US Postal Service. She was courageous and carried guns under her apron to protect herself and male from wolves, thieves, and bandits. This next sister here is Lori Kornacki. Her father was working on the car. The Japs, Jack slipped up from underneath the car and fell on top of him. She lifted the car up off of him. As a result, he's living today. So let me break down for us really how masculinity is really misconstrued. What's the name of this animal here? What is he or she known for? Protection, Protection what else? Yeah. Fighting, and also it's one more thing. Yeah. Say instability. instability. This breed was banned in more cities than any other dog breed in America. It wasn't until animal rights groups came together and realized that it wasn't the innate nature of this dog. It was how he was being trained because we eventually discovered that this animal is also a family dog, a loving family dog and companion. But if he's only trained to fight and protect, man, if you can only protect and provide, that's all you can do. You're limited, you're stuck. So masculinity does not define who we are. It's an attribute. Say we're more than masculine. Clearly, so many professions men flee from, and God has given them the passion to, to pursue because of this image of not wanting to be weak. I compare masculinity to this box of crayons, and I compare humanity to this box. As men, we choose maybe three out of the eight. But women, they grasp all 64 and work with these colors. I do exercises where I have men try to match certain colors and they realize they got to put two colors together to come up with one of the colors in the 64. And then we wonder why we can't relate to our women because they're asking for violet and we're giving them dark purple. So the next step to evolving as men is called comprehensive manhood which I shared earlier. A man who is courageous but also compassionate, strong but sensitive. A man who freely lives from the good in his heart instead of his fears. I, was, I didn't come to this, I guess, epiphany until my mother uh, developed dementia. And this is always very difficult for me to talk about because it challenged everything that I had been conditioned to believe a man was. Because I can't cry. I can't massage your feet. I can't do your nails. I can't massage your scalp. We don't do that. Masculinity is too limited. I had to become long-suffering, patient, a nurturer. This me fouling her, nail, uh, fouling her nails here. 
we've been lied to as men. When Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash with his daughter Gianna and nine others, men from all over the world were moved, not by his ability to play basketball, but by who he was as a father, the nurturing side of this warrior. As a result, the hashtag girl dad went viral and the men all over the world start sharing pictures of themselves being nurturers. Just because I'm a nurturer doesn't make me feminine. So let me be clear. So masculinity and, and, and femininity, we eradicate those in our academy. We teach our boys to live under the term humanity. You're supposed to have access to everything. My son had ear surgery. Make a long story short, because of time, after the surgery was over, he woke up screaming and crying. Me and my wife hear him in the waiting room. We're like, yo, what's going on? So the nurse comes, Mrs. Wilson, she didn't come to me. Mrs. Wilson, do you mind coming back to calm your son down? I was offended, because I'm a nurturer. But I said, hey, my wife's a registered nurse, she got this. She goes back, I'm still sitting. Ah, hear my son yell again. I get up, go to the desk. Excuse me, I need to go back and see my son. Well, Mr. Mr. Wilson, Mrs. Wilson back there. I said, no, you don't understand. Here comes the masculinity. I need you to open that door so I can go see my son. Let me go back, put my hand on my son's chest because my wife couldn't calm him down. Within a matter of seconds, I said, son, it's okay. You're just scared. The power of a man's nurturing calmed the entire room. Again, Mike Tyson, I could go on and on. Yes. We saw what happened when he was only a masculine male. Yes. Yes. But we missed the other side of Mike. But now we're seeing this side. Because he says that other guy, he didn't like that guy. And if we be real with ourselves, men, we don't like that guy either. Because we know we're more than him. But the hardest thing for us to do is to deal with ourselves. To look in the mirror and go inward and face everything that's causing us to not live to our highest potential. So I did a chart here, and I want to compare the attributes of a masculine male versus a comprehensive man. So I'm gonna ask you, let's go, one, two, three, read that. A masculine male of what? A comprehensive man does what? A masculine male does? But a comprehensive man, and I say non-masculine just so you understand what I mean. M masculine male. Hmm. <laughs> I'm never threatened by another man's success. Like the brothers, we took a picture together. I can't see because the lights are in my eyes. And they were like, man, I love what you're doing, man. Thank you. And I, I commended them because we're all in this together. I'm excited when I see other men succeed and do more than I can do. A masculine male. But a comprehensive man. Key word is superior. Men say superior. superior. It's 20 years in October that our nonprofit will have been serving youth and families in Detroit, Michigan. That wouldn't have happened without my wife. I tell you that right now. Her gift in administration, her skill set, is superior than mine, men. I have friends who have nonprofits. One was struggling. I asked him, let me see his staff directory. He had all men and one woman. I said, that's your problem. <laughs> he changed that. <laughs> he, said, he changed it, and now his nonprofit is thriving. 
But when you're focused only on protecting and providing, you're actually setting yourself up to be an insecure man because you're limited. When I start expressing myself to my wife, the real cause and effect, why I'm angry, that's our first emotion we go to. Instead of just getting angry or hitting something, a table in my home, I said, wow, Nicole, that really hurts. After all these years, you still don't trust me to leave this home financially and I've never made a mistake. Now my wife comes from here to here because now we're talking to each other's hearts. A masculine male. Men, say that louder. Say it. One, two, three. Come on, men. I teach my boys and my men to feel fear. You do not succumb to it in the wrong moments, but feeling fear can actually leave you, lead you away from an early death. However, at the same time, the brain's main function is to protect you. So if I'm in a situation, a guy has a gun in front of me or a knife and my family's behind me and my brain say, run, Jay, I can't leave my family. I feel the fear, but then I give myself an opportunity to respond in the best way possible. But if you teach a boy that he has to be fearless, you're telling him something that no human can do. As Soon as you become a parent and you have a child, you realize that fear is real because your child is like your heart walking outside of your body if you love your children. A comprehensive man. I tell my wife when I feel fear. She admires it, but she also admires how I can push through when I have to. Because she sees an example of a comprehensive man, she doesn't have to fear and worry. She understands that, hey, sometimes there'll be some sadness, but sometimes there'll be joy. And we're going to embrace both of them. Lastly, a masculine male is what? A comprehensive man. Crucial. This is what we teach our boys. This is proof of this. Over 78% of our recruits improve their grade point average by one letter grade within 16 weeks without academic tutoring. Wow. Wow. These are boys celebrating. That's my son, he just got a 4.0. But look at these images. So I wanna share with you some of our ways how we create comprehensive men. This is uh, what we call an emotional check-in. We do this every time before we train. No martial arts, nothing starts until we see where you are mentally. How are you feeling today? So we open the group up. The boys share all of their concerns. And I'll be honest with you for uh, my other brothers and sisters of different ethnicity, I thought it was a black issue at first until I had an opportunity to work with white students or other kids of different backgrounds. It's the same issue. Maybe even worse because they're told, everything is okay, Johnny. You got dad here. We got two cars, but dad isn't around. Dad goes every weekend having his fun and doing what he needs to do, but Johnny is lonely. Uh, there's this, it's this expectation that they have to uh, succeed from what one kid told me. Mr. Wilson, I don't have room to fail because all my family is educated and I have the resources, but I feel like I'm losing grip right now. Men, if you can download this right now, and women for your sons and men for yourselves, it's called The Filling Wheel by Dr. Gloria Wilcox. I pass this out, I give this, it's in my book, Battle Cry. It's imperative, this is what we use to teach men how to express deeper emotions, the root cause of what they're feeling. If you look at the center of the wheel, these are typically the emotions we're quick to express as humans. But the second tier, is really the closest to what we really need to express. But in the third tier is actually how we're feeling. If I made this wheel for men, that entire circle in the middle would be anger. That's our go-to emotion. 
because again, we only believe that we can protect and provide. What do we say to each other, brother, when we're going through a difficult time? We say, stay what? Is it possible to stay strong, man? Say no. It's not. What happens when we tell each other that, brothers? When we feel the moment of weakness, now we feel that we're not a man. It's impossible to stay strong. Number two, affirm your son daily. Every day I tell my son how much I love him, how great he is. I don't care what anyone tells you about your inability to play sports or whatever you want to do. I love you and I believe that eventually you're going to truly walk in what God has called for you to do. Put out attributes, put them on the wall, affirmations, who you are. You are strong, kind, assertive, intelligent. I am confident, generous, wise, and courageous. Have him repeat those every day before he goes to school. Number three, crucial. Cell phone and tablet nightly check-in. Did you know this? On average, each teenager sent 33.5 text messages per night when they were supposed to be asleep. I can't tell you how many times I caught my son in the middle of the night on his phone. Cause we have, he has to put his phone and iPad in our room. And I was wondering, why you can't get up, dude? You got like 12 hours of sleep, you know? because he's on his phone. Second, 75% of the participants had persistent problems with falling asleep. This next clip, so you see how real it is. I took his phone for this very reason and then cut it on two days later. Look at all the text messages he had. Do you see the pressure? Watch, I'm serious, it keep going. Watch this. And so you wonder why they can't focus. Look at that. That hurts my heart because I've caught myself telling my daughter that you don't know stress. Wait till you get a job, wait till you gotta pay bills. Truth be told, if we had that pressure now, I don't think we can handle it, to be real with you. They can't leave school like we could. Something happens at school, it follows them now on social media. As adults and parents, we have to have empathy towards what our children are dealing with. If it's a big problem to them, act like it's a milestone or something major for you. Make sure you're present with them in that moment when they're sharing their heart with you. Lastly, individual and family counseling and therapy. We pay for this at our nonprofit. Any parent that need this with the family, don't worry about it, go. We have psychotherapists and counselor, counselors ready to serve and help our kids. Now, this has been a big issue in the black community, and I say in my city. This is my psychotherapist. He's not black, as you can see. And I get the reason why we would like to have someone of our culture, because they can relate to what we're dealing with. But at the same time, I didn't need this man to know about my culture, I need him to understand trauma to help me. What was interesting, I didn't meet him, and this is a little funny, his name is Dr. Tim Bro. And when I saw that, I heard the name Bro, I thought he was a brother, which was ridiculous. <laughs> and so, uh, when I met him, this man is just amazing. Um, I didn't feel unheard with him. And as men, that's what we need. The worst thing you can do, women, you desire for your husband to open up, never, ever impassively dismiss how he's feeling when he opens his heart for you. When you do that, you've closed the door. Men, please 
If your goal is to have a black therapist, cool, I get it. But start. I'm serious. This is a cause and effect and a good story to end on. This is my, well, one was my first uh, project, I would say. His name is James. I met him when the Cave of Adullam had a pilot at a school in Highland Park, Michigan. When I met James, he averaged four detentions and one suspension a month. He smoked an average of two blunts a week. A week. His GPA was 0.8. His behavior honor level, uh, behavioral honor level was three. Three being the lowest, one being the highest. His principal repeatedly threatened to expel him. James, oh, I got 45 seconds. <laughs> James experienced significant trauma. His father wasn't in his life at the time. He just needed a man to come in and give him an opportunity to be human. I paid, James, uh, I paid for James to go to a, a, a Young Life, it's called Young Life Campus, a Christian camp for young men, and I guess women as well, but this one was specifically for young boys. I get a phone call from one of the counselors saying, Mr. Wilson, you need to talk to James. He's, something's wrong. I said, put him on the phone. James was like, crying and yelling like, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, come get me. I'm like, why? They're trying to set me up. What are you talking about? They're trying to set you up, James. Well, no one's this nice. <laughs> I said, James, I put you with my friends there. You'll be fine. And they're great individuals. Trust me. Because he was stuck in trauma and no one was there to walk him through where he had been, he was still stuck. He was still in fight or flight. As a result of the training, I taught James how to break through two of his main issues, which were anger or unresolved anger and lack of focus. And he was able to break through not only physically, but mentally as well. His detentions and suspensions were eliminated. He overcame his marijuana addiction. His GPA improved from a 0.8 to a 2.1. His behavioral honor level from a three to a one within 12 weeks. And he graduated on time. He was set up for poverty. But someone intervened. And that's why I'm honored to be here. Because all of you are doing the same. And if not, you desire to do so, which is why you're here. This was James' testimony. And this is how long ago this was. Look at Facebook. <laughs> He says, Jason, I never told you thanks for having the cave at GWC. I finally learned self-control and learned from the creed and training what a real warrior is. Things like weed is not needed for me to deal with life. I now know that negatives in my life are the obstacles I face, are tests we are put through to grow and thrive and not things to be depressed about. Thanks. He sent me this picture. This is him, he stays in Phoenix, Arizona now. And if this isn't a testimony to when you allow a boy to feel and a grown man to heal, I don't know what is. So I just want to thank you for your time. I'm right there and I appreciate you and I hope it was a blessing. Thank you. Y'all keep giving it up for Jason Wilson. Jason, thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you all, because you have no idea um, what this kind of healing means for those of us that have gone through this. It's only when you discover that kind of healing that you can recognize when the real shows up. So that's why 
you know, I work so hard to bring this to you because remember, I keep telling y'all, I'm not hood adjacent, I'm hood immersed. And I see this day in and day out. Kia boys, reckless driving. Now your perspective should change. It has to shift. You got, we have to do a better job at understanding that our babies aren't just this way. It's not normal. It's not normal. And so I am so grateful. Um, when I set out, um, Sheila can attest to, um, when I set out to do my research, I literally, I was in such, I said, somebody got to see this. Because, you know, we have to lift this work. Um, so I'm grateful. And I'm, I don't want to run out of our time, but y'all know I'm emotional too. So I'm just grateful.